We thank the young people for leading us into the presence of God. We come together as a church. We come into God's awesome presence. And we're only able to do that 
by the blood of Jesus, by the grace that he has shown to us. And so we come into his presence and we ask God to shine on us that he will illumine our hearts and that we can go out from here and we can send forth the word of God. That's what we're going to begin singing this morning. If you're able to do so, please stand. Let's sing together. chapter 2. He writes, remember that you were at one time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers in the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law and the commandments committed in the ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. The stones we were stacking Brothers and sisters, one family. 
important for you to know how God uses your gifts to produce results. Southern Baptist churches like yours fund North America missions through two primary sources. First, the cooperative program. Your gifts to the CP typically come from your church budget and then go directly to your state convention. Each state then sends a portion of that money to the SBC Executive Committee and from there more than half of CP goes to the International Mission Board. NAM SBC seminaries and other entities receive a percentage as well. NAM receives 22.79% of cooperative program dollars. We use those funds to support evangelism events, to support ministry centers and missionaries, to endorse chaplains, and for operations. Altogether, those funds make up 35% of our budget. But the largest part of NAM's budget, 50%, comes from the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. More than 100 years ago, this offering was named for a bold missions advocate who rallied SBC churches in support of missionaries. Today, Southern Baptists have thousands of missionaries serving in North America. They are spreading the gospel through Sin Network, our church planning arm, and Sin Relief, our evangelistic compassion ministry area. And when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering through special offerings, your church budget, or directly to NAM, you're helping these missionaries by providing the fuel to assess, train, coach, and care for them. It helps pay for things like Bibles, curriculum, ministry equipment, or even rent for a worship facility. Some churches may refer to this offering as the North America Missions Offering or something else. Whatever you choose to call the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, it is unique because every dollar goes directly to support missionaries where the need and the opportunity are the greatest. It goes all over North America, including our largest, most influential cities where the gospel presence has been on the decline. Your giving helps plant new, reproducing churches. And now, in many urban areas, we're starting to gain ground. It goes to places like international and refugee communities where tens of thousands of people, many from countries close to the gospel, move every year. 
Your giving is sending missionaries to love them and share the hope of Christ. In a hundred different ways, in a thousand different places, all of your gifts are enabling missionaries to start new churches, baptize new believers, and make disciples. That's how your giving works. As you pray and give, we at the North American Mission Board are so grateful to be your partner, helping you fulfill the Great Commission. Together with you and your church, every day we are sending hope. What an encouraging message and what an encouraging thing to be in the, the family of God as we've joined here together to worship together. We're also connected all throughout this world with other believers and our prayers and our concerns and even our giving should be in support of them and what they're doing. It is a great thing and a great work that we get to be a partner in. And many of you could testify to maybe going on trips or knowing folks that work and serve in the missions area or mission field. And we see their hard work and their efforts and we know we want to continue to help them as much as possible. So... Welcome, welcome. If you're a guest this morning, we're glad you've come to join us this morning. Just a quick thing for you. If you got a, a bulletin handed to you coming in, there's a little tear-off strip in the back. If you just fill that out, uh, give it to somebody here at the back doors as you're headed out, or just hand it to someone beside you. But we'd love to have a record of your visit today. And a reminder to the church here, this is a place for you to write uh, prayer requests and praises. We love praying over those things together as a staff on Monday morning we gather together. It also helps us be connected to you and what's happening in your life, and that's a big deal. Because we need to be connected to one another in this place so we know how to pray for one another and how to care for one another. Um, want to be reminded, too, of how good God is to us all the time. And so... Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Let's pray together, and let's aim at a couple of things in our prayer. We want to be thinking about not only what we're going to do in this place today and what we want God to do in us and through us, but what he, we want uh, to see him doing in the world. So let's pray together. Father God, we love you, and we thank you so much for how you first loved us. Lord, thank you for this beautiful example as these children sang this morning. To remind us that you are super big, and you're super strong. Lord, you're over and above everything. There is no other God beside you, Lord. You are the great God, the creator, the one that has given us life, the one that has given us this very day, and we're thankful to you for that. And Father, we just want to tell you, Lord, that we love you here. I pray that each and every one of us in this room today, Lord, has an expectant heart, that we're asking you and seeking you, Lord, through your word and through your spirit to, to know you more clearly today, Lord. Help that be what we do in this place. And the Father, we're reminded of all those people in this world who are so needing of you. Lord, thank you for the uh, Annie Armstrong and the giving and, and the ministry work that goes out through Southern Baptist. But Lord, thank you for all of us that are connected together through the, the blood of Jesus Christ and, and are part of the family of God. Lord, right now my heart is heavy for those in Haiti. And we've had friends that have served there as missionaries in the past and some that are there now, Lord, and have been there recently. We just ask that you would be with them. Father, there's so much turmoil, so much conflict there. And Lord, there's so much darkness there spiritually. We need the gospel to shine. Lord, would you do a miracle? Would you just move on the hearts of the people there and somehow, Father, bless? We pray for those that are toiling and serving there now, Lord, just to be helped. Father, we think about all the conflicts that have happened recently in, in Israel and Gaza, and our hearts are still broken for that situation, Lord. We know it's, your heart is even more broken. And so we pray for peace and healing. And Lord, for those that have been taken captive to be returned. Lord, right now we know and recognize and we state it to you, Lord, that we know it. There's more persecution of Christians on the planet today, Lord, than ever. Christians being rounded up in other places in this world. And, and not only being persecuted, some being killed because they love you, Jesus. Lord, we know that you won't let their blood go unnoticed and unannounced. But, Father, in the meantime, we know that you've also given us a task and a responsibility to reach this world for you, Lord. We pray for the nations. Lord, you said my house will be a house of prayer for the nations, Lord, and we're going to do that. And so, Father, we lift up not only the nations, we lift up our country and all the people here. But more than anything, Lord, we want you to be glorified in each and every one of us. Let our hearts now just focus in and just, just point right at you. So that when we leave this place, Lord, our hearts and our attitudes and our prayers, everything we have will be pointed back to you, Father, and to this world that is in such need. Lord, you're good all the time. Not everybody knows that yet, so help us to help them know that. So give us the strength we need, the words we need, and everything. And we're going to give you praise and honor and glory that you deserve, Father, because you are super big and you are super strong. 
but you're super gracious and grace-filled. And we love you for that. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together once again. Whether you are upright or whether you are down low, we all can stand on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I'm saved from my enemies.
how good it is to be reminded uh, that we have a shelter, we have a strong tower. Uh, there is a lot that is shaky these days. There are a lot of uh, things that you can trust in, a lot of things that you can put your hope in that will ultimately fail you, but there is one who will never fail. Amen? There is one who has a perfect track record that all whom he has in his hands, he is faithful to keep. All that he has promised to hold, he will indeed hold all the way into eternity. We can trust in him. I was reminded in the song, we sang a little bit uh, of, of the Psalms and several uh, different Psalms there, but we also sang uh, one of my favorite Psalms, which is Psalm 73. And in Psalm 73, uh, the writer Asaph asks, whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth there is none that I desire besides you. And I pray that that would not just be words that you sing, uh, melodies that you can uh, uh, get in, uh, in sync with and so on, but that that would be the very song of your hearts and the very song of your souls. Uh, if, you could, if I could say this, I'm, I'm on a bit of a mission uh, here at Mount Vernon, and that is to close the gap to close the gap between us and the Lord. Uh, if you are singing from a distance, you're too far off. Uh, we are to come close to the Lord in worship, to, to sing from our very hearts and to sing from our very souls. And we wanna make sure that, uh, that we are doing just that, that when we gather together, you should sense the very presence of the living God among us. Do you sense that when you gather together? That we are in the very presence of the Lord as we gather together as his people. It is so good to worship him. And worship does not end the moment that the musicians and the singers come off of the platform. Uh, worship even now is going on as we humble ourselves under the word of God. And so with that note, would you please stand and turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 is where we are this morning. Philippians chapter 1. And when you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. All right, sounds good. Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 27, Paul writes, only let your manner of life, and we're going to work on that because I think there's a better way to translate that, be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So, if there is any engagement, or I'm sorry, encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is the word of God. Amen. And now let's pray and ask that he would give us the grace that we need, not just to hear, but to heed this word. Let's pray. 
But Father, in this moment, right here in this hour, we need you. We need to hear a word from you. We come, Lord, with distracted hearts that need to be realigned with you. And so we pray, Father, would you do just that? We come tired. Some come weary. Some come struggling. And we've all gathered here into one space as one people saying with one voice, speak to us, Lord. For we cannot go another day without hearing from you. But Father, we realize that you could speak to us and it could sound like, like, like a totally different language to us. We, we, in order for us to hear what you say and in order for us to heed what you say, we need the Spirit of God to do a work in us. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, move among us. Take this word, Lord, and, and implant it into our hearts and into our minds. May it be the way we think. May it become who we are. And Lord, I know that there are some who are here that don't trust in Christ as their Savior. And the kind of community that Paul is speaking about in this passage is just so foreign to them. It perhaps is something that they've longed for, but they've perhaps never thought that it was possible. But Lord, we know that with you all things are possible. And so I pray, Father, that they who are looking for this kind of connection, who are looking for this kind of community, Father, I pray that they would find that community in Christ. And that they would turn from their false gods and turn from their false gospels and trust in you, the living God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Savior and Lord. Lord, we ask big things because we know, Lord, that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So, Lord, magnify your name, exalt your Son, move Holy Spirit, and may we be filled with great joy, not just because we have heard from you, but because we trust that you are able to do this in us. And we thank you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There doesn't seem to be much uniting the United States of America these days. Some would say that we're more divided than ever before, although I'm just going to take a, a shot in the dark and say that the Civil War era, uh, era was probably a little bit more divided than we are today. Um, but it's probably safe to say that this is the most divided that we have ever been in our lifetime. There's so many things that divide us today. You think of politics. Are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? Are you conservative or are you a libertarian or are you a liberal or are you a progressive or are you a nationalist? And all of these different things that divide us politically or even geographically. Are you more of an East Coast person? Are you more of a Midwestern person? Are you more of a Southern, Deep South, or Southwest, or West Coast, or Northwest, and all of this, urban and suburban, rural, uh, you know, and all of these different areas, all these things and all these living areas divide us. We can't agree on soda, Coke, or Pepsi, right? Or all these things, you know, sweet tea or, or unsweet tea, um, which is almost like saying saved or unsaved, you know, they're just <laughs> all these things. Even technology, are you an Apple person, are you, a, are you an Android person, are you a Microsoft person, uh, do, you, do you just write things out and don't use computers at all, you know, all these things that divide us. Carolina barbecue. Yeah, or, uh, you know, how does that, you know, even that divides us. We've even learned a word in our, in our public realm that's kind of crept in over the last couple of, word, a couple of years. It's the word algorithm. 
How many of you all have heard a lot about algorithms these days? Yeah, you see, what happens is our, our social media apps and so on, they, they are, are set to, uh, to keep your attention. So if there's something that you've liked or, or a website that you've viewed or whatever, it remembers that and then starts to connect you with things that, that, that are along those lines. And so you could be looking at uh, your social media app and you could be exposed to news stories and exposed to ads and all of that that the person next to you is never seeing or anything. So uh, it, it, what happens is if you follow this particular uh, stream of, say, politics or this political worldview, you could be hearing all of this that, that confirms your own biases and demonizes the other side. And this happens over and over again. So you, all you're hearing, if you uh, are clicking on a bunch of Republican ads or whatever, is that the Republicans are the greatest people on the face of the earth and the Democrats are demons. Or, or if you're on a Democratic side, you'd hear the Democrats are the greatest people in the world and Republicans are demons and all of that. And it's confirming our own biases and full, uh, further uh, pulling us apart from each other. We have these tribalism, uh, uh, this tribalism that is continuing to, to run rampant in our culture, leading to deeper and deeper divisions. And some divisions we can even see in the church today. I remember hearing a story about a guy that was stranded on the top of a mountain, and a relief helicopter flew over, and uh, one of the paramedics yelled from the, uh, from the helicopter, I, don't worry, I'm here to rescue you. I'm here to help you. I just, I just have one question first, first uh, before, I, before I rescue you. Um, do, do you believe in God or are you an atheist? And the guy said, oh, I, I believe in God. Well, great, me too. Um, are, are you a Christian? Do you believe in the Christian God or you do, be, do you believe in another God? Uh, oh, I believe in the Christian God. Oh, great, me too. Um, are, are you a, a Catholic or are you a Protestant? I'm a Protestant. Oh, great, me too. Um, are, are you an evangelical Protestant or are you a mainline Protestant? Well, I'm an evangelical Protestant. Great, me too. Uh, are, are you a, a, a baby baptizing uh, evangelical Protestant or are you a, a believer baptizing evangelical Protestant? Oh, I'm, I'm a Baptist. I'm, a, I'm a, a, a believer baptizing. I got to keep my lines. A believing baptizing you know, evangelical Protestant. Oh, that's great. Are, are you a Northern Baptist or a Southern? I'm a Southern Baptist. Great, me too. Are, are you in Bible inerrancy believing Southern Baptist? Or are you a non-Bible believing inerrancy? Son? Oh, I'm a Bible believing inerrancy. Son. Great, me too. Uh, are you an elder led congregational rule Bible inerrancy believing Southern Baptist? Or oh, I, oh yeah, 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 that's me. Okay, cool. Are you a premillennial elder led congregational Bible inerrancy believing Southern Baptist? Or are you uh, a, a post tribulational? Uh, what, what am I saying? A post tribulational. <laughs> Uh, you know, all of that. He says, well, I'm a post-tribulational, elder-led, congregational, Bible inerrancy believing Southern Baptist, to which the paramedic said, you're a heretic, and then he flew off. <laughs> Isn't that how it is for most of our churches? You, you know, you've got to be all the way down to the T, and if you are anything else than everything that we are, then you're not welcome here. Divisions. Divisions, divisions, divisions. And yet we see in this passage a view and a vision for a different kind of church. A church that is not defined by who we aren't, but a church that's defined by who we are. A church that is banded together with, with a single-mindedness. With one purpose. Look at the text. Look at this. He says in verse 27, he says that, that uh, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. Now, if, you, if you're a Bible uh, marker like I am, this is a good thing to mark in your Bibles. Good thing to underline in your Bibles. If you're the one that says, this is the sacred text. 
and I don't underline anything. I do not tamper with God's word or anything like that. That's fine. Just remember this when you look at it. Mark it in your brain, okay? So look what he says in verse 27. He says that uh, whether I see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm, mark this, in one spirit. And then look what he says next to that. With one mind, striving, check this out, underline this, side by side for the faith of the gospel. Do you hear those, those, that unity language there? One spirit, one mind, side, uh, side by side. You see that? Look at chapter two. He says in verse two, complete my joy by being, here it is again, under, underline, the same mind, having, underline, the same mind, or the same love, being in, underline this, full accord, and, as he says here, of one mind. Do you see the language here? Paul's talking about a church that is on the same page. This is a church that it doesn't, it doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean we're all the same people. It doesn't mean that we all have the same tastes and we all have the same likes and all of that. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is there's something that ties us all together so much so that we could call ourselves, if you will, a United State. <laughs> In, this divided, in the divided states of America, God, should, God is raising up among us a united state, his church. And we live together, and we grow together, and we walk together in that unity, in that bond. What does that look like? What's that look like? What does it look like to be a united state citizen. <laughs> well, there are two things that I think that uh, the Apostle Paul is teaching us here in the text, and we're just going to pay attention to what he's saying here. We're, we're continuing in this series as we're walking our way through Philippians. I've, I've uh, quite humorously called it squad goals uh, because it, this is the community that God is bringing together. He's putting together a team. He's putting together a squad. And what kind of team is there that doesn't have unity? Uh, you know, we, we could talk about um, certain colleges and their teams and so on. And uh, we could talk about one particular team uh, that, you know, came from the bottom and made it all the way up to the top in, in five days and, or five games. We could talk about, you know, some teams and so on. And that, that requires a whole lot of teamwork, right? It, it requires having one goal and working together as one and so on. Things that, you know, other teams with, you know, slightly lighter blue colors and so on, weren't exactly accomplishing yesterday. And that's okay. I, I'm not I'm here to divide. I'm here to unite, you know, <laughs> United State. You know, that's what we're talking about this morning. But, <laughs> but you know, you see uh, uh, the, the, on this, on, in sports, you see on the court, you see in all this stuff, the, the, typically the team that is working together as one is the team that wins. And the team that struggles to work together is the team that typically loses teamwork matters and God is laying this out for us in Philippians through the Apostle Paul that we are to work together for the sake of the gospel common purpose common goal well what does that look like I think this passage is really getting to the heart of that what does that look like first things first we must be a united front against gospel threats we must be a united front against gospel threats look at what he says in verse 27 only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, I already said before we, walked, uh, before we got into the passage that we got to work on the translation here just a little bit. That phrase, uh, let your manner of life be, is actually one word in the Greek. <laughs> it's one word that's really difficult to translate. The word there is polituistha. Polituista, and if you hear in polituista, the, 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 the root polit, that's good. You're supposed to hear that. Polit is the root from the Greek where we get our words like politics and policy and politician and all of that. Even polis, like Minneapolis or Annapolis, right? It's the word for city. All right, a city or a state or something along those lines. As a verb, he's talking here about how we are to live as citizens. 
It's, it's referring to our citizenship. And he's not talking here to the Philippians of, a, of their Roman citizenship. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a citizenship that they have, as we'll say in chapter 3, in heaven. In fact, once you look at that, chapter 3, turn over to chapter 3 and look at verse 20. In chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. The noun here is the same root as the verb in verse 27. Our citizenship is in heaven, 320. So live out your citizenship, 127, in a manner worthy of, of the gospel of Christ. Do you see what he's saying here? If we are citizens of heaven, then we should act like it. That's what he's saying. You are a citizen of heaven. If you are here and you are not a follower of Christ, you right now have a single citizenship. You are a citizen, perhaps, of the United States of America. Uh, but when you come to faith in Jesus, you receive dual status. <laughs> you are a citizen of the United States of America, all of us here, but you also have citizenship to a much better kingdom. One that is not made by human hands. One that cannot be shaken by the things of this world. One that is not ruled by an elected official, but one that is ruled by a king who has no elections. <laughs> a king who has absolute power, absolute authority, and that would terrify us if we were talking about, uh, uh, about uh, Pennsylvania Avenue right? That would terrify us to have one who has absolute authority and all of that. Well, that's why we have checks and balances and all of that in our governmental system. But this one is one who is perfect in all of his ways, oh, full of righteousness and goodness, and we can entrust him with our very lives and our very future, and we do so as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Our citizenship is in heaven, well, if, you're hit, if you are here and you do not trust Christ as your Savior, right now you may not be a citizen of heaven, but you can be. You can be a part of this kingdom. You can be a part of our Lord's rule. You can submit to him and give your life to him. And he promises, unlike all of the campaign promises that we will hear this year, he is able to keep his promises because he has shed his blood on the cross and God raised him from the dead so that these promises find their yes and amen in him. This is good news and we want you to know that good news. We want you to trust in Jesus. Give your life to him. Become a citizen of heaven and you will find a king unlike any other politician who will never let you down, okay? Our citizenship is in heaven and if our citizenship is in heaven, he says, act like it. Well, how do you act like it? Well, look again what he says. He says, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, of course, referring to his imprisonment, he's still in chains as he's writing this letter. And he says, I don't know, as we saw in the previous passages, I don't know if I'm going to come and see you. I don't know if they're going to execute me. But, but whether I come and see you or am absent, it doesn't matter. This is how you should live regardless. And he says, I may, that I may hear of you three things. One, that you are standing firm in the one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and are not frightened in anything by your opponents. What he's saying for us, if we're going to be a united front against gospel threats, is we've got to hold the line. You've got to hold the line. Do you see that? We are standing firm in one spirit. We are striving with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and we are not frightened in anything by our opponents. Stand firm in one spirit. It's the idea that all of us together, we're not wobbly or anything like that. No, if you're going to hold this line for the sake of the gospel, you've got to get a good footing, and you've got to stand firm. Maybe you've seen this before when you see in other countries, uh, uh, you have militaries, uh, 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 oppressive uh, uh, militaries that are trying to take over in a military coup or so on. And you see the citizens standing, locking arms together, standing side by side and saying, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to go through us. Well, that's what he's saying here. If you're going to come and you're going to try to tamper with the gospel or you're going to try to end the cause of Christ, you're going to have to go through us in order to do it. 
That's what he's saying. You're standing firm with one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The word there for striving is, uh, is where we get our word athlete from. I believe the word is athlontes. It's where we get our word athlete. It's the idea of competing, striving, straining, working hard in order to accomplish the goals. That's how we should be together. We are side by side striving for the faith of the gospel, that it spreads to the ends of the earth and also that it works in us. We grow, we're growing up in the faith of the gospel and we're growing out uh, for the faith of the gospel. And he says there that we are not frightened, not intimidated by any of our opponents in anything. There's this fearlessness that should mark us as believers. I know I've, I've, I've said it before, but I'm just going to keep harping on it until the Lord creates this in us. We are in a chicken little society where everybody is running around going, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. We as Christians should be the coolest cats in the country. We should be the ones, as we see all of these things going on, we should be the ones saying, you know, things are a little crazy. Things are going a little haywire and all that, but there's a God in heaven who is exactly who he says he is, and I'm not going to allow the news or the media or all these talking heads shake my faith and my confidence that my God is able to do everything that he said he's going to do. There's a fearlessness that says, what are you going to do? You're going to take away my liberties? You're going to take away my rights? You're going to take away my life? You may do all of those things, but I serve a God who raised Jesus from the dead. And if you take my life, I know that he is faithful and able to raise me up from the dead as well. There is nothing that you can do to me that our Lord can't overcome at the end of days. Do whatever you want. Have at it. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep on talking. And I'm going to keep on shouting. And I'm going to keep on praising. And I'm going to keep on telling people about Jesus. You can't stop me. That's how we are as believers. Oh my goodness. We should be the fearless ones in this world. The ones doing crazy stuff. Going to countries where they say, you can't go to that country. That's a closed country. There's no such thing as a closed country. Because our God is God. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Go! Go! You say, but I, it may be dangerous over there. Oh, you want to know what's more dangerous? Standing before the Lord and him asking you why you didn't go. Go to the hard places. Go into the hard communities. Build relationships with hard people. Why? Because we're fearless. I know what my God is able to do. I know what this gospel is capable of. You can't stop us. Oh, we must be a united front against these threats that come. We need to hold the line. But also notice, when you hold the line, you're also being the sign. You see what he says there in verse 28? He says this is a clear sign to them of their destruction. Two things. It's a sign of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. Note, when we are a united front, when we're standing firm, with all boldness and courage, it sends a message to those who oppose the gospel. One, it says, wow, maybe we are about to get destroyed. <laughs> because we're trying to intimidate them. We're trying to put pressure on them. And they're just standing tall and standing firm, looking at us. In fact, almost smirking, saying, what, did you think that that was going to stop us? Did you think that that was going to silence us? No, we can't, as the apostle said in the book of Acts, we, we can't but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. You think that you're going to, that, that with your pressure and with your beatings and with your uh, uh, stripping of rights and all these things, you honestly think that's going to keep us from saying what we know is true? No. By the way, this is the difference between a profession and a confession. With a profession, you just say stuff, right? But you may not necessarily be willing to put any skin in the game if, you, if, if, if push comes to shove. But with a confession, oh, you can't get this out of me. 
This is so lodged in me and lodged in my soul that even if you try to silence me, you can't silence me because it's not just that I've got a hold of this, it's got a hold of me. See? And that's what he wants us to be with the gospel. And when we are that way, it's a sign of their destruction. We aren't budging. There is a God who is holy and he has indeed given us his word and given us his requirements and we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God and there is a judgment that is to come and all who do not bend their knee and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord will face that judgment on that day. Either you are going on your own terms trying to save yourself and you will fail or you go in Christ and Jesus our Lord will save you and rescue you from the wrath of God to come there are only two roads here and when we go with that conviction and say you may beat us you may whip us you may mock us you may blackball us you may cancel us but what you can't do is stop us because this is the truth and that should send a message to them what is it with these people that they don't budge what is it what about these people that they just seem so convinced that this is true Maybe I need to pay attention a little bit more to what they're saying. It's a sign of their destruction, but it's also a sign of your salvation. You see, in another day, there may have been a time where you would be intimidated like this and you would fold up like, like, a, like a tent, right? You would just, you, know, uh, uh, you, uh, you, you are, uh, you're going to get it. I'm going to what? Uh, 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 what I meant to say was, um, uh, you, really, you really got it. Yeah, you, you're go get her. Go get it. That's what I meant to say. Go, you go get it. And we just fold, right? But there's something about the gospel that we go, no, 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 I'm not going to budge on this. And that is God showing you that he actually is doing a mighty work in you. Remember the disciples? Remember the disciples when uh, we were there in the upper room and, and uh, the apostle Peter himself, uh, when he said, you know, all of y'all are going to desert me. The Lord Jesus said that to them. All of y'all are going to desert me. And Peter says, no, Lord, stop talking like that. I got you. Yeah, I'm going to be with you all the way nobody's going to do anything. Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. No, I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a prophet. I, I know these things. Um, <laughs> you, you, you will. And sure enough, what happened? Aren't you one of those guys over there, one of those Galileans? That are, no, 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 no. I don't even know who that is. I've never seen that guy before in my life. I don't know who that is. No, no, no. Actually, you, 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 aren't you one of the... No, no, uh-uh. No, no, no. I'm not. I, I, I don't even know who he is. G Jesus who? <laughs> right? Well, you've got that accent. You, you, you sound like one of those folks from the north and all that. No, no, no. And they even uh, pronounced a curse. It says he began to curse and swear, which isn't he was saying bad words. He was... No, no, no. You know, God forbid. You know, uh, may God strike me down if if I, if I know that guy, I don't know who that guy is. And as soon as he heard, ah, 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 and he realized that he did exactly what the Lord said. Three times you would deny me. And sure enough, he denied him. And it said he went and wept bitterly. Because it was in that moment that he was supposed to stand firm for the faith. And it was in that moment that he blinked. He flinched. And he realized that he didn't have the power and the strength to stand for Jesus. That's Paul, oh, I'm sorry, that's Peter before. But something amazing happened when on Pentecost the Holy Spirit came down. And the Spirit now is in Peter. And you find Peter in and out of prison, <laughs> you find Peter getting beaten. You find them uh, uh, taking him in. Remember in Acts 12 when they were going to crucify him. They had just had in the previous Passover, they had crucified Jesus. And now here they are in the following Passover. It seems that that was a hit. And so Herod says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to now take the head of the church now. I'm going to take Peter and I'm going to put him you know, and crucify him just like I crucified Jesus. And Peter is there in prison and Peter is not crying. Peter is not weeping. Peter is not wailing. 
morning, Peter is sitting there in that prison, bold and courageous, knowing that God is able to rescue him and knowing that nothing can stop him. When they tried to beat him and they said, we told you not to speak in that name, Peter says, you can do whatever you want, but I know that there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. I'm going to trust in Jesus and I'm going to keep preaching Jesus. You're going to have to kill me, but you're never going to be able to shut me up. What happened to Peter? I've never seen him before in my life. That was before. You're going to have to kill me. That's after. What happened? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit fills him, and now with the Spirit inside of him, there's a boldness and there's a courage that says, I have to proclaim Jesus. I can't keep it inside, and nothing's going to stop me because this is the one who is able to save the world. Do you know this? Do you have the Spirit in you? Then why are you afraid? There's nothing to be afraid of. God is in you. There's nothing to be afraid of. God is with you. There's nothing to be afraid of. God's gone before you. There's nothing to be afraid of. God's got you. And that's how it can be a confirmation of your salvation. Look what he says in verse 29. He says, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Note, the Lord has granted two things. The Lord has granted that you believe in him. It's a gift of his grace. And he says here, another gift of his grace is that you suffer. You say, that's the kind of gift that I want. (laughs) <laughs> could, could I get a better gift? Can I re-gift? Can we exchange gifts? Can we do like a white elephant type of thing? Like what's going on here? Um, is suffering is a gift? Yeah, it is. Look what he says. He says, you're engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now here that I still have. Notice when you are suffering, you are suffering for his sake. And when you are suffering, you are standing in the long line of champions of the faith. You are standing with Paul. You are standing with Peter. You are standing with James, who before Peter was thrown in prison in Acts 12, James, the brother of John, was beheaded. Uh, you, you, you stand in the line of all the disciples. The only one who was able to live and die a natural death was John, the apostle John. All the other apostles were executed. All of them. You're able to stand in the long line of the martyrs who came before us in centuries before. You're able to stand with those who were persecuted for the cross. They were cut in two. They were burned alive. Even to this day, those who are sitting in prison and who are being tortured all over the world for the cause of Christ, there are more believers being persecuted right now in 2024 than ever before in the history of the church. No, it doesn't make our news. No, we don't get the headlines because the world couldn't care less, but we should care about these things. And as our brothers and sisters all over the world are suffering for the cause of Christ, you get to join in with them and say, this is worth the fight. This is worth the fight. Jesus is worth living for. Jesus is worth dying for. Yeah, be a united front against gospel threats if we're going to be a united state. But not only that, notice he says here, we must have a united heart for gospel friends. We must not only be a united front against gospel threats, we must also have a united heart for gospel friends. That's what verses 1 through 4 tell us. He says, so if there's any uh, encouragement in Christ, any comfort for love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Okay, again, he's saying all these unity terms, but notice there in verse two, he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind and so forth. In other words, if we're going to be a united heart for gospel friends, realize there's an advantage of that. It completes our joy. It completes our joy. Your joy is made complete when we are, when we have this united heart with one another. Being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, it completes our joy. Notice Paul is after joy. You want to be happy in this life? 
You want to enjoy the company of brothers and sisters in Christ? You want church to be an enjoyable relationship? I know there's some who may not want it to be enjoyable. You actually, you know, uh, get, get a little bit of a thrill from, from being a grump, and that's okay. You know, there's always some, you know, they're like, I actually like this. Kind of like the, the movie with Tommy Lee Jones where he goes, this is my happy face, right? You know, and for some of you, that th this may be your happy face. You know, you just, you know, get a little bit on the curmudgeonly side and things like that. That's fine. But he says here that church actually can be an enjoyable place. It actually can be a place that you can't wait to go to. It can actually be a place for your kids to say, can we go to church? I really want to go to church. I can't wait until we go to church and all of that. How does that happen? He says, when we're of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. There it is. Well, how do we get there? Verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. If you notice the language there, selfish ambition, conceit, it sounds a lot like the folks he was talking about in chapter one who were preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry and all of that kind of stuff. He said, if that's the kind of church that you want where it's just dog eat dog, right? Every man for himself, kind of battle royale every time we gather together and all of that, you can have that kind of church, but what you're never gonna have is joy. But if you want joy, you got to get over yourself. <laughs> you, you've, got, you've got to consider others above you. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. He also goes on in verse 4. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other, words, in other words, not only do we consider others above ourselves, but we also care for others' needs above ourselves. We're in a church that where, where your responsibility and, and your goal is to go beyond yourself to see the others that are around you and to care for their needs so that they know that they are loved. You are the instrument. You are the, the funnel, if you will, through which the Lord flows his love and his grace and his care to other people and other believers. When you hug, as I said uh, several weeks ago, when you come to a brother or sister in Christ and you give them a big old hug, they should sense the Lord himself hugging them in your hugs. <laughs> That's what he wants you to do. He, when, when, when you are meeting others' needs, there's somebody who has some type of financial concern or whatever, and the Lord raises you up to help them out in generosity, that's the Lord helping them out in generosity, and he used you in his grace and his kindness. You are the one through whom that happens, but that can't happen if you're looking inward, and you're only thinking about yourself. You can come to church saying, well, what's in it for me? And there's some who leave church because they didn't get what they thought they should get. But what if you come into church to say, what do other people need? And what can I do to help meet that need? Other people need to grow in Christ. Hey, I could help uh, start a Bible study or I could help with a discipleship group or, or something. Or you know what, I'm gonna be more engaged in my life group or, or things like that. That's you looking outside of yourself. Hey, you know, this person over here is struggling. You know what? Let's put together, you know, a team of folks who are going to minister to them. Maybe somebody had a loss or something like that. Hey, let's put together some meals and let's go and help them and all of that. That's you getting away from yourself and going towards the needs of others. This is what the church is and this is what we do. And he says, this is what I'm calling for you to be and for you to do. And notice, when everybody is engaged in meeting the needs of everybody else, you want to know what happens in the process? You actually are being cared for. If I'm focused on myself and all of us are focused on ourselves, it's easy for needs to fall through the cracks and it's easy for people to fall through the cracks. But if everyone is looking outward towards everyone else, everyone's needs are being met. Everyone is being cared for. And in the process, all of us are being knit and stitched together. That's grace. That's the kind of gospel community that God wants. So the question you need to ask yourself is, who is overlooked among us? Who are the ones that are not being cared well for? And the next question you'd ask is, how can I help? What can I do to help? What can I do? Where are the gaps in our witness, in our community? What can I do to help? 
<laughs> how can I pitch in and how can I get engaged? How could we improve as a church family? Uh, what can I do to help? How can we engage the, uh, uh, the, and, and spread the gospel even further? What can I do to help? These are the questions that you should be asking if we're going to be a united heart. So This is what our Lord wants from us. He wants us to be a united front against gospel threats, and he wants us to be a united heart toward our gospel friends. And notice, it doesn't just end with what we do together in our community as a local church, but it's also how we connect with our brothers and sisters in other places and so on as well. Just like this afternoon, we're going to be gathering together at Joyner Park uh, for, the, uh, for the renewal event. And there are going to be several churches there. Hey, you get an opportunity to meet other believers, pray together, praise the Lord together, encourage them in the Lord. This is a way, again, that we can show that we are united. We, we preach the same gospel. We want to reach the same community with the good news of Jesus Christ, that means that we get over ourselves. And that means that we do whatever it takes to make sure that the gospel continues to flow. Even if that means partnering with brothers and sisters abroad, hey, that's great, because all of Raleigh can't fit in this building. Have you noticed that? We're, we're a little, we, Daniel's saying we're a church without walls, but we literally have walls. Okay, <laughs> so the metaphorical walls, we shouldn't have those things, but actual physical walls, we have those things. We can't fit all of Raleigh in here, but what would it be like if the entire city of Raleigh was empty on Sunday morning because everyone was in every one of these gospel preaching churches all around our community? Wouldn't that be amazing? And that's what we can get involved in, and that's what we can get be a part of. And so let's have this same united heart. Loving one another in here, partnering and caring for our brothers and sisters beyond here, showing the world that the gospel is what is front and center in our lives and in our hearts. We may live in a divided world, but we should not be a divided church. We should be a united state. And so let's go together as a united front. Let's go together with a united heart. And let's be amazed at what our Lord will do through our witness as we seek to follow him in all of our ways. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, so if you are here today and you do not trust our Lord Jesus as your Savior, perhaps you are amazed to hear that there is a kind of community where people are not navel-gazing, we're not looking at ourselves and all concerned about our own interests and all of that, but we put those interests, self-interests and creature comforts and all of those things aside because we love others. And we put others above ourselves. What kind of community is this? Well, it's a gospel community. It's a community that says that Jesus means more to us than we mean to ourselves it says that there is a love that we have been shown by our Lord Jesus Christ that we want others to know too and we want you to be a part of that as well if you are here today and you don't know that love let me tell you that love is possible and it has been made possible through our Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life so that we would be freed from our sin, free from the wrath of God, and free to live and to have life more abundantly. And he wants you to have that life. He wants you to know this love. And so right where you are, the scriptures say that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So right now, admit it. Admit that Jesus is the Christ. Admit that he is king. Admit that he is the Lord whom God has raised from the dead and he says you will be saved. Maybe there's some of you that are here today and you do trust in Jesus, but perhaps you have felt more of this division than you have this unity. Perhaps you have been putting yourself over the needs of your church family. Perhaps you have not been going with the gospel front and center in your mind and in your heart. And the Lord right now is saying, turn. Turn from that. That's not the way to live. The 
The way to live is to lower yourself so that you may see the needs around and love with the love of Jesus. And so right now, where you are, cry out to him and say, Lord, would you please make me like this? Shape me like this. May I be known for my humility and my care for others. Take away the selfishness and the self-centeredness that I may live and love like Jesus. Wherever you are right now, if you want to come up and pray here at the steps, you can go ahead and come up and pray. If you need someone to pray with you, I'd be happy to pray with you. We've got others as well. I see Kevin in the back. Uh, uh, He'd be happy to pray with you as well. But as we sing, may our song and may our prayers be our response to God's word. He has spoken. And let's pray that God would make us like he has shown us here in Philippians 2. Let's pray and let's respond to God's word. Let's stand together. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, just a couple of announcements before you leave. Uh, Pastor Ron Jewer mentioned about the gathering this afternoon, renewal at Joyner Park in Wake Forest from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Bring your lawn chairs. Uh, it's just a time of fun, fellowship, and worship. I uh, hope all of you will, uh, we can see all of you there this afternoon. Also, um, uh, if you're a first-time visitor, there's a welcome table outside. And we might even find a little gift there for you. Uh, So stop by that welcome table. Um, If you want to meet the pastor, he's going to be available in the the, uh, foyer out there as well after the service. So you can stop by and meet him. Uh, A word about our Easter uh, Sunday coming up. Um, Different schedule. Not just Sunday, but Friday we're going to have something new. We're going to have a good Friday service here in this building, in this room at 630 on Friday, uh, and then on Sunday, we'll start with a, a, a sunrise service out at the Old Mount Vernon at 7 o'clock, followed by breakfast at 745, and then here back at the church, 9 o'clock, we will have worship service together for Easter. There's no Sunday school on, on Easter Sunday. 
Uh, if you like to give an offering, there are baskets at either door. You can do that on your way out. So let's leave in prayer. Father, we just love you. We thank you for uh, this time that we spent together today, uh, united in worship of your son Jesus, Lord. We pray that we too would leave here united, working together as citizens of your kingdom. Lord, may everything we do as we leave here bring honor and glory to the name of your son Jesus. It's his name that we pray. Amen.